So welcome all, thank you uh, for coming along. Uh, as you know, you've all got a copy of the paper. This is um, a paper, a CPD to be delivered by Glenn Fredericks um, on the implication um, of terms, including uh, the term of good faith and reasonableness. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, two members of our floor argued a uh, High Court decision in Barker, which uh, Glenn will address. That dealt with a, a related issue. Um, that, that was whether or not um, in the employment context there was a term that the employer um, would not, without reasonable cause, conduct itself in a manner likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of trust and confidence between an employee and employer. Um, the High Court rejected that there would be such a, uh, a negative duty implied um, into the class of employment contracts, but it expressly left open the possibility that there would be a, a more general term of good faith and reasonableness um, in contracts generally. Uh, I just want to speak for a, a couple of minutes on the doctrinal foundations of uh, this nascent term of uh, good faith and reasonableness. Um, going back to 1864, um, in a case of Stirling and Maitland, uh, Chief Justice Coburn uh, said this, if a party enters into an arrangement which can only take effect by the continuance of a certain existing state of circumstances, there is an implied engagement on his part that he shall do nothing on his own motion to put an end to that state of circumstances under which alone the arrangement can be operative. Um, and then fast forward another uh, 15 or so years, Lord Blackburn in Mackay and Dick, 1881, says something slightly different, and this is what I want to pick up on, because there's a, uh, a slight divergence in what the doctrinal foundation for this implied term is. Um, so Lord Blackburn's take on it was this. Where in a contract it appears that both parties have agreed that something shall be done, which cannot effectually be done unless both concur in doing it, the construction of the contract is that each agrees to do all that is necessary to be done on his part for the carrying out of that thing. Um, though there may be no express words that affect um, what is the part of each must depend on the circumstances. So you note that in the first one, Coburn CJ talks about implication, whereas Blackburn talks about construction. Uh, and uh, if you read papers that have um, been written on this point in Australia, um, for example, Dr Elizabeth Peden, um, she's very much of the view that the doctrinal foundation is one of construction and not of implication. But in New South Wales, of course, we um, trace all of this back to uh, Renard Constructions and the decision of Priestley um, in particular. Now, for those of you that don't recall, um, Renard was a, uh, a construction contract. Um, Clause 44, I'm only mentioning that because it becomes relevant in a second, um, provided that um, if the contractor defaults in the performance or observance of any covenant, condition or stipulation in the contract, um, then the contractor could do a number of things, including uh, take over the whole or part of the remaining works, in other words, take over the contract or cancel the contract. And um, you, you'll notice the, uh, the broad terms um, of, the, of, of the language there. So the contractor had a very, very wide discretion uh, and they ultimately did um, purport to give notice, show cause and to uh, cancel the contract. So the matter comes um, on appeal. By that stage in New South Wales, this contract, by the way, was a standard form construction contract. There'd been three decisions on it and the same question had arisen in each case. Was there an implied term? Um, as to how that discretion under Clause 44 should be exercised. Um, Brownlee said, yes, there was an implied term. Cole said, then, no, there wasn't. And Giles said that there was no implied term. So that was the, the, um, the procedural background before the matter came before Priestley. Um, now, Priestley dealt with it first by way of whether or not there was an uh, implication in fact, and this is the BP refineries test, as you all know. Um, and his honour found that there was, and uh, Max, you might take particular interest in this, because what he did is he was looking at what the party's um, actual intention was, how they would have actually gone about 
um, reaching a, a contract, notwithstanding it was in standard terms. Uh, he said that the overriding purpose of the contract from both the contractors and the principal's point of view is to have the contract work completed by the contractor in accordance with the contract um, in return for payment, it's pretty standard. The insertion of a subclause such as 44, not subject to the constraint of reasonable use by the principal, is quite inconsistent with all the main contractual promises by each party um, to the contract to the other. The contract can, in my opinion, only be effective as a workable business document under which the promises of each party to the other may be fulfilled if the subclause is read in a way which I have indicated, that is, subject to the requirements of reasonableness. Um, and that's what he found to be implied as a matter of fact. He then went on to deal with it as a, as a class of contract and also found that the, uh, the term would be implied as a matter of law. Um, now, once we then uh, get to the High Court, um, the High Court in Burn and Frew looked at implication in law and implication in fact, and uh, they boiled it down to say that in substance, um, each test is really um, derived from the, uh, or based on the same consideration, that is one of necessity. Um, and, and that's where I want to leave it, but leave you with this, that as a practitioner, if one was faced with uh, this dilemma as to um, whether or not a, an implied term of good faith and reasonableness should um, exist in a contract that you're dealing with, uh, would you take that route? Would you, would you go down the path of seeking to satisfy tests of implication in fact and in law and deal with that problem of necessity and all the hurdles you have to jump through? Um, the, the tests are, as you know, quite difficult. Or would you deal with it on the basis of construction? You're not necessarily met with those tests, you can simply make a submission as to how the contract should be read um, and you're, you're free, um, unfettered in that sense. Um, and in my view, it's probably likely to produce an outcome um, that is um, not based on a, a more general concept of some uh, indeterminate content and, and Glenn will deal with the problems of content in, in terms like this because they can be wide ranging. Um, so in my view, it would be far more attractive to a judge to deal with something on a, on a more ad hoc basis, um, on a question of construction, rather than a, um, a broader implication which would have to be uh, dealt with across the board and introduce notions of public policy and the like. Glenn, over to you. Um, thanks, Tom. And I should say thanks also for your help in getting this paper together. Um, much appreciated. Look, the implied term of, of good faith is one that I, th I think is interest of, of interest for me, particularly having been at the in-house employment lawyer at the Commonwealth Bank at the time, Barker, um, was being being run and, and seeing how that that fared and sort of looking at the, the implied term of, of trust and confidence and pondering how that might work and what restrictions that have. You know, might have on, on employer discretions to do things or employer obligations to do things, of course. And I think as an employment lawyer, we probably all have seen, particularly pre-Barker, that the term good faith and trust and confidence was used, you know, often used fairly interchangeably, or in fact, the, the term was often called the you know, good faith and trust and confidence term. Um, there was certainly, uh, with that, with that term, a, a lack of precision ar around what it meant in, in terms of trust and confidence, whether or not it was linked to good faith, and that's, as we were talking about before, is obviously one of the concerns of the High Court in, in, in deciding that term was implied, and I think Jessup looked at that as well in his dissent um, in, in, the, in the majority, sorry, in his dissent in the, in the full court decision in, in Barker. And if anyone wants a, a read on the history of good faith, that's probably, sorry, of trust and confidence, that's a decision you need to have a look at. But those issues which the High Court dealt with, had to deal with in, in Barker, it seems to me, are going to be the same sorts of things if, you know, if, if and when the High Court only gets to deal with good faith as a contractual term, um, it will have to ha consider those issues when, when deciding whether or not there is an implied term of, of good faith in um, contracts generally or in... Um, a particular class of contract, depending on how the matter might ultimately get to the, the High Court. Although, as um, John Carter notes in one of his papers that, I, that I've cited a couple of times, the High Court doesn't very often get to deal with contract cases, so we may well be um, waiting for quite some time before we get any sort of resolution 
from um, the High Court, particularly if, it, you know, if it's not going to get helpful hints along the way, um, and just then, you know, at, at the moment we have to make do with really what the, the intermediate appellate courts and, and how, they, how they are dealing with it. And frankly, it, as I've set out in the paper, it is a, it's a bit of a mix. Um, John Carter, um, you know, quite bluntly, just calls it the situation incoherent um, about whether there actually is an implied term of good faith in contracts as a, as a general rule of law, and if there is such a term, what it actually means. And there has been, as I said out in the paper, a reasonable degree of case law in favour of it. And I'll take I'll take us through those as I've done in the paper, particularly in New South Wales, and some commentary in favour of there there being a term. Um, I've cited um, Joel and Riley's paper um, article with the Melbourne University Law Review um, about looking at good faith and the, and the trust and confidence terms, which he calls siblings, not twins, and that was written pre Barker, and she was quite enthusiastic, it has to be said, about, or, uh, about the existence of those terms in, as a matter of Australian law. Um, and also, I, I, I don't think I quoted any of her post-Barker post um, papers where she was expressing her disappointment about the High Court's approach in that case. But putting that to one side, people like John Carter, Elizabeth Pedden and other writers tend to recognise that the situation is a bit of a mess, um, both as to what the whether the term is there and what it actually means. And I know Tom gave us a bit of a brief introduction um, about the doctrinal basis for the term, which I started looking at for the paper, and um, I have to confess, I sort of, I, I sort of abandoned, because I couldn't quite work out what the doctrinal basis for the term was. I think you mentioned Mackay, for example, was one of the earlier English cases. And I was looking at that, and think, looking at the case and thinking, well, is, has that really necessarily got anything to do with good faith because it's really more along the term the, the, cooperate, the term of cooperation that parties have to cooperate so each other get the benefit of the contract or how sometimes it's alternatively put you can't undermine the commercial purpose of a contract and it seems to me that the cases that, that Mackay sort of is indicative of are more indicative of that term rather than needing um, any real term a, a different term called good faith whatever that might mean and again, Elizabeth Peden, in her book on the implication of the good faith term into the contracts, actually deals with, um, looks at the interaction between the duty, to co duty of cooperation and, and the um, implied term of good faith. So where are we? I mean, it has been recognised in a number of courts. We've had some hints from the High Court that they're not in favour, with um, Justice Kirby referring to the conflict with the fundamental notions of caveat emptor that are inherent in common law conceptions of economic freedom um, and appears to be inconsistent with the law as otherwise developed in the, in the country in respect to the introduction of implied terms. And I think, obviously, you know, some concern there about how this term might interact with what we've already got. And that was, again, a concern in Bach with the implied term of, good, of um, trust and confidence, how that was going to interact with other implied terms. We also have North um, being... I'm not overly enthusiastic in another one of my matters as a Commonwealth Bank about, about the term. And I think it's interesting, you've got some people like Justice Kirby and Justice North who you might think on one view it would be instinctively favourable towards there being a term of good faith, um, get, get, um, given how they tend, uh, tend to approach matters, and yet here they are uh, saying that that term doesn't exist. And there's... Um, so, obviously an issue there about where we're going to go. So, what what uh, paper looks at here? What is encompassed by the term of good faith? And Sir Anthony Mason suggested that there would, uh, writing extrajudicially, suggested there were three parts to it. One is an obligation on the parties to cooperate in achieving the contractual objects. The question whether you need that if we've got an implied term of cooperation, compliance with honest standards of conduct, um, and compliance with standards of conduct which are reasonable, having regard to the interests of the parties. Um, that and that, that, that those three that um, quote of Anthony Mason's has, has been cited in a number of cases with varying degrees of approval. Um, and however, it'd be difficult to say that that definition, where the term has been adopted, particularly in New South Wales, it has taken that point, ha have adopted that definition. In Renard, which Tom has spoken to us about, we got a lengthy consideration from Justice Priestley on the meaning and the antecedents of good faith. And he was looking at, particularly in the term, 
in, in terms of reasonableness. Um, and you see that a lot when you're looking at the expression of good faith. It's often, in fact, the term is sometimes expressed as the obligation to act reasonably and in good faith. You know, so you get that port manteau term, a bit like you used to get with good faith and trust and confidence. But it seems the idea of, of reasonableness and acting in good faith um, you know, run together. Um, they may or may not be part of the same term, picking up Sir Anthony Mason's point. Um, Justice Priestley said that people have grown used to the courts applying standards of fairness to a contract, which are wholly consistent with the existence in all contracts of a duty upon the parties of good faith and fair dealing in its performance. Um, and it's interesting he's saying then that people are used to this given this is a case that at least in New South Wales are seeing them as the main case introducing the concept into contracts, um, into commercial contracts at least. And he then mentions this um, close association of ideas between the terms unreasonableness, lack of good faith and unconscionability. Um, although they're not, you know, they don't completely overlap, um, th there is a fair degree of overlap, overlap in their contents. Which again, from my point of view, questions if you've got those duties, other duties already, or those uh, restraints on discretion, then question how much more work there is going to be for a term of good faith to do. Um, in Alcatel, Scheller looked at it as a restriction on rights of a party. If the terms go um, wider than is necessary, then in a commercial contract, then the, um, the, the power is, um, or well, that discretion rather is restricted, so it can't be exercised in a capricious or arbitrary manner or for an extraneous purpose. And he saw that as a manifestation of the, um, the term of good faith. Now, we would, I know Max and he, we were talking about before about that Silverbrook and Schiller was um, you know, one of the, ma the main decision in that. And um, interesting in that case, which was a, how a, um, a discretion whether or not to, um, to grant options was to be exercised and what, how the decision making was to go about it. Um, Shell had used the same similar wording when he was looking at the restraints on that, um, the exercise of that discretion or on how the party, how the decision maker was to go about forming a decision. Interestingly enough, in Silverbrook, he didn't really use the term um, good faith at all, as far as I can tell in my reading of the decision or doing a trusty old, you know, control their find exercise on the decision it seems the only place it really turns up is in the head note but it's interesting those same concepts that we see here in the guise of good faith just come under the guise of reasonableness or as an implied restraint on on someone's discretion in say in an employment contract now I should add that that approach which is also taken in Bartlett and other cases seems to be a pretty significant part of the law now and, and we can probably go so far as to say it's accepted that where there is a discretion, at least in an employment contract, um, that discretion has to be exercised reasonably unless there's um, some, some actual explicit contractual term to the contrary. Um, so if you've got that situation, why do we actually need to have something then, then called good faith? Does it really do much more or is that just another way of implementing you know, an implied term of good faith? Following Alcatel, we then had um, Burger King, um, which again discussed the term at, in, in the context of reasonableness. So New South Wales, the big two um, are, are really Renard and Burger King, and they're the ones, if you look at this, that you'll see cited a lot. Um, there hasn't been uni a uniformity from um, the Court of Appeal, even in this, and the um, case of CGU workers' compensation uh, Mason stated that those Renard and Burger King, and he mentioned a couple of other cases as well, do not establish that such an implied term is to be inserted into every contract or even into every aspect of a particular contract. Um, and um, actually, the, John Carter makes a point that, you, at least when he wrote the paper, that that was the last Court of Appeal word on it. And so, strictly speaking, everyone should be bound by that. And so we might be able to regard the law as being that there is no implied term um, Chief Justice also in the Federal Court, when looking at um, Pachiocco, the, um, the, the bank fees case, um, again had quite a long look at what good faith meant um, and tried to summarise the obligation. In, in its 
it's an obligation that, with all due respect, picks up quite a lot of different concepts and puts them under the guise of good faith. And if you look at all the different aspects of that, you can sort of track back individual parts of that where different judges in different cases have said this is what good faith actually mean. My, my personal favourite definition of good faith is to not act, to not act in bad faith. Um, and I, I love that because it's just so unhelpful. You, know, it, you just sort of wonder how far that's intended to, to get anyone. Um, but Chief Justice also then sets out a whole range of, of things that might be encompassed by the obligation of good faith. And I have to say, again, perhaps picking up our early conversation about Barker, one can't help but think that the, the wider the definition and the more it picks up, the less likely the High Court is to say it's implied into um, contracts generally. That just doesn't seem to be what they want to do. Um, he also, in, in a previous um, Court of Appeal decision, had expressed what good faith does not cover. So it doesn't import or presumably introduce notions of fiduciary obligation um, or an obligation to act in the interests of the other party. Um, in, in Barker, Keifel said that it dealt with fairness in dealings between contracting parties, um, and the obligation is wider of that in honesty than uh, wider than that of just simple requirement to be honest. I then ha had another look at Barker because, as I say in the paper, if, if the High Court has you know, recognising that you know, the earlier overlap we often saw between good faith and trust and confidence, um, if the High Court has said there's no obligation of you know, general implied duty of trust and confidence in a contract, they're not going to recognise, my view, they're not going to recognise a, 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 a term of good faith that simply rebadges a term of trust and confidence. You don't get it back in there by calling it some, something else. So one can assume that while there would clearly be an overlap, um, one assumes that you know, dishonest conduct can be a breach of both a term of good faith and a term of trust and confidence. Um, in fact, going back to Malik, I mean, that, that term was breached because the employer there ran a dishonest business. Um, one would think, though, that to the extent the, the, the substance of a good faith term could have been caught by a, a trust and confidence term, the High Court is not going to approve that as being part um, of, of contracts generally. And the term there um, was that in Barker, uh, was that neither party will, without reasonable cause, conduct itself in a manner likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of trust and confidence between them. Um, and it's interesting, if you look back on the previous page to what, how, what also describes as the, the definition or the, the good faith term encompassing, one can see that on one view what they're just at least partially different ways of describing the same thing, you know, an obligation to um, really just maintain the relationship properly, to act reasonably and with fair dealings having regard to the interests of the parties. Is that really all different, that much different to saying that you won't without reasonable cause conduct yourself in a manner likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of, tr of trust and confidence between the parties. Um, I, I, I suspect it doesn't. Um, there's also the need to um, also have a look at the general obligation uh, to cooperate or to act cooperatively. Presumably the term is different again from, that is different again from good faith or again recognising there may be some overlap and the the duty to cooperate is described as being anchored upon the need for one party to take a positive step without which the other party is unable to enjoy a right or benefit conferred upon it by the contract. And that harks back to Mackay, of course, where good faith theoretically was born. Um, and of course, the duty of cooperation didn't really get much of a run in Barker because it wasn't, has to attach to a benefit under a contract and there wasn't one that could be identified there. In other jurisdictions, um, in England it appears at the moment there's not a, 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 duty, a general duty recognised in good faith in matters of contract, which is interesting given that's where trust and confidence um, was really born, that that ha hasn't been affirmed in England. In Canada, it has been relatively recently in the in 2014 case of um, Basin, B-H-A-S-I-N, where it, it, it involved, to put it in very simple terms, a, a relationship where one party had the right ultimately to take over the business of another party um, or to continue a contract. And there was a, a degree of um, I guess subterfuge or dishonesty about how that, that party was 
approaching its exercise of that right. Um, and the Canadian Supreme Court, um, recognising the Anglo-Canadian law and also refer, also referred to English and Australian law, had previously resisted acknowledging any generalised or independent doctrine of good faith performance of contracts, which um, perhaps the words that ring a bell if you're looking at Australian law, had resulted in an unsettled and incoherent body of law. And the court in Canada, perhaps contrary to what we might expect the High Court to do here, um, said to, took two steps. The first is to acknowledge that good faith contractual performance is a general organising principle of the common law of contract. And that secondly, there is a common law duty which applies to all contracts to act honestly in the performance of contractual obligations. And that's how they're framed um, in simple terms the, the good faith obligation in, in Canada. In the, in the United States, there's the Uniform Commercial Code, which um, provides that every contract or duty within this Act imposes an obligation of good faith in its performance or enforcement. Um, the, the Uniform Commercial Code um, in the US isn't actually uniform. It's adopted to different degrees by different US states, or in some instances, not at all. Um, but I think that term is fairly commonly adopted. And it actually goes further and defines good faith um, as honesty in fact and the observance of reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing. Um, it's probably not too distant to the Canadian one. Um, and similar to, to how the term is discussed in some instances in, in Australia, but certainly narrower um, perhaps than the definition proposed by Allsop. And then we have the the, the, the secondary statement of contracts in the US, which purports to say, to say that the law is every contract imposes upon each party a duty of good faith and fair dealing in its performance and enforcement. So there, there we are with the definition. Now, I guess a spectrum of how this this term might be might be defined. For one thing, it might just be simply a duty to act honestly, or at least engage fairly with parties. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, it might pick up a whole lot of other duties as well, including you know, the duty to act confident, uh, to, to act cooperatively, and perhaps even aspects of the, the duty of, of trust and uh, of confidence. And then having a look at the, the legislative framework, um, important for a couple of reasons. Obviously, if you're talking about good faith in contracts, you need to know where legislation has imposed that. And then secondly, given the, the approach of the High Court, in terms of whether or not it's going to imply terms and the extent to which it's left it to Parliament, you know, to leave things to Parliament. One, perhaps suggesting, um, as the High Court said, that, that in Barker they looked at the sim symbiotic relationship of legislation and, and common law. Um, and it may well be, accordingly, that the more, you know, the, a court can say, well, look, this, the aspects of good faith are being dealt with in a range of, range of areas by different parliaments. Um, to the extent there are gaps, we can only assume parliaments you know, have intended that those gaps be there. Um, and on that basis, there's less of a motive for the court to step in. Um, and certainly, as I said elsewhere, the High Court have um, been shown a reluctance to take what they consider to be a legislative step um, when imposing new terms and contracts. Um, so there's a few, few in, I just put out really just a, a select instances of, of um, duties of good faith where they, they, they go directly in, in, into con contractual conduct. Um, and one doesn't have to look too hard to find many more others dealing with contracts. And then, of course, there's a whole range of other obligations on people in non-contractual circumstances to act in good faith. For example, directors under the, um, you know, the Corporations Act have to discharge their duties in good faith in the interests of the, um, of the company and, and members. The Franchising Code of Conduct is one which requires that each party must act towards another party with good faith within the meaning of the unwritten law from time to time. Um, so, and that, of course, that's right. <laughs> someone assumes then someone's going to be able to find uh, what the, um, the unwritten law actually is and, 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 and resolve that with some confidence, which is, I think has a degree of ambition about it. But they also, um, it also defines, also says that a court can have regard to um, in deciding whether or not someone has acted in good faith about, or rather contravene their obligation to act in good faith. It's a bit 
of an indirect way to go about it that the court may have regard to whether the party acted honestly and not arbitrarily. You know, so picking up some words we've heard from Canada or Mason or and arbitrarily, you know, the silver book, the words that Scheller uses, and whether the party cooperated to achieve the purposes of the agreement, which again imports into good faith notions that we, we've really probably seen in other implied terms and other obligations. You know. um, again, going back to Mackay, you know, the duty to cooperate and not to undermine the, the commercial purposes of the agreement. Um, and the ASIC Act takes a, um, again, takes a similar approach, um, which says that um, it poses a prohibition on a person acting in conduct which is unconscionable in connection with the supply, actually I should say, or acquisition of financial services. Um, and then Section 12C then provides that in deciding whether or not there's been a breach of that obligation, they look at whether or not someone has acted in good faith. Um, and again, the Australian consumer law does that as well. It says there's an obligation not to act in unconscionable conduct. And then one of the matters that a court may have a look at in deciding whether or not that obligation has been breached is whether or not the parties have acted in good faith. So it's, it's a bit of a circular way to go about it. Um, more explicitly, inserting a term into a contract um, is the Insurance Contracts Act. Um, and that, for those familiar with insurance, will know the obligation there is of, uh, it's not a good faith, but it's of utmost good faith, faith which is a much broader um, notion, a much more, um, much rigorous, uh, if you like, ob obligation. And, um, and I'll put in, in the footnote there some of the, uh, the points that a court will regard as being part of that duty, um, including in, um, full and frank disclosure. Um, so going, but that's actually an instance where there, there is an implied term in a contract by virtue of the legislation. Of course, the employment relationship, we don't have um, that sort of direct implication of implied term um, and, and less of an ability to, to do with that. Um, obviously, under the, yeah, we have that, you know, the, I guess the ACL obligations regarding you know, negotiations leading into a contract of employment. We have those, um, you know, we, ha we have the, perhaps the, the duty to exercise any discretion under the contract reasonably. But interestingly, what we don't have is what they have in New Zealand, um, where the Employment Relations Act 2000 provides that parties to an employment relationship must deal with each other in good faith and then can't do anything to mislead or deceive each other or that is likely to mislead or deceive each other. And that's um, a requirement. I don't think it's expressed as actually as a contractual term, but I think it's just expressed as a statutory requirement that's how party has, parties to an employment relationship have to deal with each other. So we're a, a fair way short of, of that in Australia. The, the last thing I want to have a look at in the paper is um, what's been happening post Barker with the potential for an implied term and, and what the High Court might do if it does um, if it does have the opportunity to consider this. As I noted, in Barker, the, the plurality, plurality in there, which is French, Bell and Keane, stated that the common law in Australia must involve within the limits of judicial power and not trespass into the province of legislative action. And then when it was discussing the obligation of trust and confidence, said that a judicial announcement of an obligation of mutual trust and confidence to be applied as an incident of employment contracts and applicable to employers and employees alike involves the assumption of by courts of a regulatory function defined by reference to a broadly framed normative standard. So which is quite strongly put. Um, and then goes on to say, I'll put a further quote, that, you know, that there are species of judicial lawmaking which are, which are not to be made lightly and they, it's a necessary condition that they are justified functionally by reference to the effective performance of the class of contract to which they apply. And then go on to say, implications which might be thought reasonable are not on that account only necessary. The same constraints apply whether or not such implications are characterised as rules of construction. So I think we can say that the High Court's of the view is it's not going to be good enough that this might be a nice to have um, or that you know, contracts, it's not going to disrupt contracts too much to, to have that obligation in there. The High Court's going to look to say, or well, can contracts function um, 
without this term uh, is it a necessary incidence of, of this class of contract. Um, and I think you know, in, in the consideration of the issue of trust and confidence, I can't think it was the High Court, it was Jessup, but someone said, with, with respect to the term of trust and confidence, well, we've been doing pretty well without it for the last you know, 100, 150 years or so. It does rather suggest that it's not actually necessary to imply that term into contracts and question whether they might take the same approach with good faith if we've sort of been doing reasonably okay without it. Um, you know, assuming they find it's not part of the law already, um, if we've been doing reasonably okay without it, does it indicate that it's not really necessary? Um, they did say, however, and perhaps for those people who, who would like to see the term in there, there was some encouraging words that broadly framed normative standards are familiar to, to courts required to apply in common law or statutory settings criteria such as reasonableness, good faith and unconscionability. So I think we can say from that, while on its face, you know, if, if, if it requires something of a legislative approach from the court, they're not going to, High Court, they're not going to be that welcome to it. But if it's simply imposing standards of behaviour on parties that are consistent with standards that they're used to applying, that they might be more inclined to do that. Question what that might ultimately mean for a term is that, would that mean there would be a distinct implied term that parties have to act honestly towards each other? Or would it just mean that any discretion or powers within the contract have to be exercised in good faith? And that will apply when, whether it's a, a generally implied term or whether you're trying to construe the terms of a particular contract. If you're looking to con construe how um, a, a, you know, a discretion has to be exercised, I, I think there would be some prospect that the High Court would say that a discretion has to be exercised in, in good faith or reasonably question whether or not um, that might ultimately mean the same thing. But I, I wouldn't say that with a degree of optimism that you know, the, the, the term of good faith is going to be um, you know, found by the High Court. Having said that, my predictions in Barker at each stage were, well, actually, in, in, other than first instance, my prediction in Barker at both full court and high court were wrong, so I don't have a particularly good track record there. My prediction for Barker after the, the first instance decision was, oh, look, we may as well appeal to the full court because they can hardly make it any worse. Um, and then they did. Um, <laughs> they were just an incredibly broad term, with all due respect to the majority. It was almost like they were bringing back the good old days of the unfair contracts provisions in New South Wales. Um, if you look at the cases since Barker, and I've focused mainly on the employment ones, contracts because we know they're the most interesting, um, you can't say that there's been any real warmness towards there being an implied term of good faith. No one has really, on my reading of it, grappled with it, um, other than perhaps Whelan. Um, but if, when you look at the analysis, and I've mentioned a few cases there, when you look at the analysis, um, it's none of them, you know, it's really between the lines, none of them are saying, yeah, look, I think ultimately there will be such a term. They're, they're all looking for a reason, to some extent, not to have to deal with it or making comments which are not overly favourable. Um, so we've got um, Shaw, where the court found wasn't necessary, um, in light of, interestingly, the statutory industrial regime which regulated the employment contracts in question. So again, if you've got that regime um, in, in place, you know, we've got awards, enterprise agreements, non-fair dismissal, all that sort of stuff, all relevant for the term of trust and confidence. If you've got all those sort of things in place, is there any work for a term of good faith to do um, in, in a contract of employment? And that sort of picks up what was the, the South Australian case, um, was it McDonald, the, when they were looking at the trust and confidence, saying we don't need to, Im we, the, the court there said we don't need to imply it because the, the contract in question is so highly regulated, there's actually no work for that um, term to do in this contract. Um, and then that's you know, harkening back to those the statutory provisions I mentioned, that's where those sort of issues come back into play. If you've got all those things, if you've got a franchise agreement, do you need an implied term of good faith? Probably not, because you've got the Franchising Code of Conduct. Um, I mentioned Grammat Nev, which is actually quite a useful um, review of the authorities, if you're interested in a, a quick tour of it. Um, the term there was hopelessly pleaded, so uh, he, he said there was no term in the contract in question as pleaded. Um, Rogolsky 
um, recognising that have been left open, issues have been left open by um, Barker. Jess of Jay um, stated that I do not believe that the existence of a term expressed um, as the, that the parties would act in good faith towards each other has ever been suggested, um, and given uh, his honest approach in, in his dissent in Barker, it's probably not surprising <coughs> he would say that, and he decided again on the facts it didn't come into play. In Whelan, um, the court stated, interestingly, that it did not consider that Australia law implies such duty into contracts and employment, so that's a reasonably definite um, uh, statement, and interestingly finding, in light of how the the approach set out by the High Court and Barker that necessity does not demand its implication into contracts of employment and also uh, there's also a lack of certainty about the content of such a duty in, in the employment context. Um, and then you get the issue of uh, the exercise of discretions and, and how they, regardless of whether or not there's a separate term or whether exercise of discretions are constrained by requirements to act in good faith or reasonably. Um, Renard was um, an, an instance of that, um, that they had to be read with the constraint of reasonable use or good faith, as otherwise it would be quite inconsistent with all the main contractual promises by each party to the contract to the other. Then I've set out a, a, a few other ones. McKeith, um, where the, ap the appellants actually accepted that a discretion regarding whether or not to provide a discretionary bonus had to be exercised in good faith. Bartlett, um, which is, a, in my view, actually more about an exercise in construing different terms of the contract than necessarily being about good faith or reasonableness, but nonetheless, the bank, the court held the bank was obliged in forming its opinion to act reasonably, at least in the Wensbury sense. And then also we have UG Rail and, and Janik, um, which Max a, a, appeared, and in that, um, that decision, the court was um, prepared to imply a term that the consideration of um, discharge, consideration whether or not someone should get options, needed to be done consistently with the proper scope and content of the relevant agreement and can't, couldn't be done arbitrarily or capriciously. Um, not necessarily put in precisely good, in terms of, the, uh, uh, of there being a good faith term, but certainly manifesting the, conf the concepts that you might expect to be part of a term of good faith. So that leads us to, to where we started. Clearly, there's some case law in New South Wales, in particular, that supports the implication of a term of good faith. Um, but it, it really, as John Carter says, there's a degree of incoherence about the existence and meaning of, of such an implied term, and which places you know, good people like ourselves in a difficult position when trying to advise on that. Uh, as John Carter, I've finished with a quote from John Carter. So at the moment, it seems we have to put up with the worst of both worlds. Cases adopting an overly, overly literal approach to construction, but at the same time, but not coherently, conjuring up implied terms with the object of contradicting the literal construction of the contract. And there we have it.